So thank you and welcome to the eBird Basics. My name is Ethan Bott and I am happy that you're here. I'm hoping that you're um, partially here for the Backyard Birding Blitz tomorrow as we, re we are asking people to submit their bird checklist virtually using eBird. eBird is a virtual or is a online database to submit bird data um, throughout the world. Uh, it's kind of like a checklist, like a paper checklist for birds, but rather than being on paper, it's online. Um, I kind of think of it as the social media of bird checklists, um, but just the more nerdier version where you're not really interacting with people too much, um, but you're contributing the science and you're, you're collecting data and doing a lot of cool things. Um, so again, tomorrow you'll need to use eBird to enter your checklist to me because I can't Usually for the green burning challenge, you give me your paper checklist, but um, eBird is the way we're gonna be doing it. Uh, all right. So today we'll be talking about the history of birds and how that relates to community science. Um, some of the, the history of community science bird related projects. Uh, then we'll talk about what is eBird. I kind of talked a little bit about it just now. And then we'll talk about why you should start using eBird and then if you're new to birding and you feel like you're not confident in your bird ID, I provide some tips to help you uh, feel a little more confident in your identification. And then we'll work through sending a checklist both online and on your phone. And then of course, we'll have questions and answers at the end, but you're, feel free to ask questions at any, any point. All right. So I'm gonna talk about, before I even talk about eBird, I'm gonna talk about one of the most famous community science uh, projects in the world, at least in the modern world, uh, related to birds, and that's the Christmas bird count. This started in 1900 uh, with 27 birders, has now grown to over 100,000 birders. Um, and so it's been, this past Christmas time was the 120th year. Um, it's really, it, it's right around Christmas time for about a month, month people go out um, at a set time depending on where you are and to collect data on birds throughout, uh, throughout the world. Um, it's one of the longest standing community science projects with birds in modern history. And it's really grown from, from as you can see, from 27 to 100,000 birds or so. Um, that's probably one of the most well-known um, community science projects with birds uh, out there. Uh, there's a, the Breeding Bird Survey, which is, is uh, a project for more advanced birders who really uh, know their birds by sight and sound very, very well. Um, but it's a, a really cool program to document the breeding, um, where breeding birds are throughout the United States. Uh, we have Nest Watch, which tracks uh, sw tree swallows, um, uh, bluebirds, and some others. Um, Hawk Watch is a program uh, that you can participate in and go to different places throughout the country to, to count hawks migrating. Um, the American Kestrel Partnership is looking at the breeding, um, the breeding behavior, the, 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 the success rate of American Kestrels with their uh, nest boxes. iNaturalist is a huge platform uh, for all, any living organism, fungi to plants to animals and birds. Uh, the, the Great Backyard Bird Count is a specifically on one weekend every year, and people go out and count birds, kind of like the Christmas bird count, but uh, at a different time of year. Uh, Journey North is mainly, is most well known for um, uh, tracking monarch migration. You can enter your sightings and stuff like that, but it uh, also tracks hummingbird migration, and so a lot of people are interested in that right now with the hummingbirds coming back. Uh, and then Snapshot Wisconsin is a local Wisconsin program that uses wildlife cameras uh, to, to track wildlife um, and they do catch birds as well. So um, it's, it's a lot of these are, are all encompassing of any living thing, animals, or just birds. All right, so now I've talked about some well-known or local uh, community science projects that relate to birds. Let's talk about eBird and how eBird is different from those other ones. First off, eBird is a worldwide monitoring program. You can collect data from, from around the world. It is in every single country that you can collect data and submit it to this uh, program. 
the American Kestrel Project. Uh, American Kestrels are not, are not, don't live in every single continent and every, well, maybe I shouldn't say every continent because I don't know that, but I know they're not in every country in the world. Um, and so, and some of these others are, are not worldwide and they're only in, uh, in the United States and stuff like that. Um, uh, eBird also focuses on all species of birds. There are over 10,000 species of birds throughout the world. And uh, almost all the birds have been recorded in, in eBird. Some of the rarest and most endangered birds, I'm guessing probably are not in eBird. Um, but 99% uh, of all birds have been recorded in eBird and you can enter data for all of them. Again, like the American Kestrel Project, uh, the Hawk Watch, uh, the Tree Swallow Project, you're looking at specific species of birds um, and you're not looking at, you're not allowing um, all the species of birds to be entered into that. The next thing is that it's a year round project or a year round uh, database. So. Uh, whether it's January or July, you can be entering data uh, to this database wherever you are in the world. The Great Backyard Bird Count, the Christmas Bird Count, those are at two specific times of the year, um, and it's, it's, it's not year-round. It also has a massive user, user base, eBird. It has half a million accounts on eBird, and that may not sound like a lot because there's seven billion people in the world, but to think that half a million people have their own personal account submitting data, tracking birds is just incredible to think of. And if you, in my other eBird lectures, I show you the growth of eBird. It's gone from like a thousand people to half a million in less than a, a decade. And it's really incredible to see how it's taking off. And they released some st statistic in the past couple of weeks with this quarantine with um, everybody being at home. The growth of eBird of number of counts has exploded around the world because so many people are birding in their backyards. Um, so that's really cool to see. And um, um, yeah. And it has a really broad spatial scope. Uh, it it kind of relates to the worldwide uh, monitoring program, but uh, there's some uh, statistics that 84% of all the landmass throughout the entire world has data from entered into eBird of birds. I think when I looked at the map that where they weren't collecting data was from the the big deserts and other countries and stuff like that, uh, where they're not really collecting, where, you, where there aren't really birds out in that area that people are collecting. So those are the main ways that eBird is different. And now I'm going to talk about um, why you should contribute and what's, what it, what's in it for you. So first of all, eBird organizes and tracks your list, all while providing scientific data. Tim gave a lecture yesterday and he kind of talked about the uh, introduction to birding and he talked about lists and how people really enjoy lists when they when they go birding and people like to know what birds they've seen in their backyard, in their state, uh, in their city and some people get very obsessive with it and some people just to like, like to know what birds they've seen and eBird allows you to record that data instantaneously and have it forever. All that data that you collect and put into eBird then goes to the cloud. Rather than being on a piece of paper that is only stuck for yourself that, that you, you see, when you submit it, you're submitting your data to, um, uh, to be analyzed by scientists, to provide conservation decisions around the world, literally, um, and so, it feels very good to know that the data that you're collecting in your backyard is making a difference. Um, and so uh, that's number one. <laughs> number two, tells you what birds are being observed and where they are. Um, when, you, when you're in eBird, um, uh, you can see if you, once you dive into it, you can kind of do your own research and to see what birds are where. Um, so if you're interested in seeing a Baltimore Oriole, or maybe a rarer bird like uh, hmm, what's a, a worm-eating warbler or something. Um, that would be a pretty rarish bird. You can go look those birds up and see where they're being seen because so many people are using eBird that you can have a good chance of going to that location where someone saw that rare bird and then seeing that. Uh, the third thing is it holds birders accountable. Uh, I know a lot of us feel uncomfortable with um, uh, bird ID all of us, including me, 
and we all make mistakes. Um, and so um, I guess it shouldn't be relied on as a crutch, but there are over 5,000 algorithms going through eBird when you submit your data, combing through your data um, to make sure you're not submitting uh, something totally crazy. Like right now, if I said I saw um, 100 Magnolia Warblers, that would be flagged and that would not be accepted into the eBird database um, where they would then analyze it. They would not use that data to analyze. Um, that's pretty absurd, absurd observation. Um, but just so you know that if you see some crazy rare bird from Asia or something, probably didn't see it. And so um, you can still enter it, but it'll, it, won't, it won't go through. So it's just nice to know that like, if you make a mistake in your identification and you put in some crazy bird that um, you're, not, you're not ruining the entire scientific database or whatever. Uh, the next thing is it makes burning accessible, social, and fun. Um, again, I kind of talked, it's kind of like the social media of birding. You can see other people's checklists, what they've been seeing. You can see your friends on there. Um, and uh, it's accessible for people that have a phone in, because then you can, um, um, you can be birding anywhere. You're, you're not um, um, stuck to your computer or to one area and you can go to all these different places. Um, I, it's just really fun seeing other people's checklists. Um, so, and it makes you a better birder because uh, you, for me, it gets you out there more knowing that you're, you're helping out conservation decisions. Um, it holds you, uh, um, it holds you accountable and it'll, it'll help you know when you're making mistakes. Like if you're, if, it'll tell you if it's a rare bird. And so otherwise you wouldn't know if it's a rare bird. So there's a lot of ways that eBird um, can help you um, in your birding and stuff like that. All right, um, so as I mentioned before, for people that feel uncomfortable about, uncomfortable about their bird ID, I highly recommend you download the Merlin Bird ID app. It's a free app through the Lab of Ornithology, which is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is the same organization that created the eBird e app. Um, this app uh, is free and there are two ways it will help you. It will if you take a photo of the bird, it uses AI to um, uh, guess what type of bird it is, or it will ask you a series of uh, five questions. Let me get my iPad quickly and I'm gonna run you through an example of this. My iPad, my iPad is charging, so I have to get it. All right, so if you, if you wanna follow along, feel free to download the Merlin Bird ID app onto your, uh, onto your phone. Oh, before I move to sharing my iPad screen with you, I'm gonna also talk about Song Sleuth, which is another free app that I encourage you to download. Um, it's uh, kind of like Shazam, the app Shazam that, uh, um, if you play like a radio song or there's uh, music going in the background, you can turn the Shazam app on and it'll identify the song that you're listening to. In a similar way, Song Sleuth will, you can record the birds singing and then it will do its best job at guessing um, as to what bird it is. So I am now going to um, share my screen with you. I think I have to stop share here, share. And then I need to share this one second. There we go. All right. So I'm going to go to the Merlin Bird ID app. Um, it'll probably ask you a couple questions before I've already pre downloaded it. So um, it might look a little different. It's going to ask you to download a bird pack. Um, so based on your location, if you're, in the, if you're in Wisconsin, you're going to download the Wisconsin or the Midwest bird app or the bird pack. Um, if you're in a different area, then you'll download the appropriate app. Um, so as I talk, I, there's the Git photo ID. Um, I haven't downloaded it. I forgot to download it prior to this. 
But if you take a photo either with a different camera or with your phone, you can then click get photo ID and you'll kind of zoom into your bird. You'll tell it the date and location and then boom, it'll ID the bird. It works really, really well if you get a clear picture of a bird, um, it will identify. It's even identified some of the trickier sparrows and um, some, of the, uh, some of the warblers as well. But it's all based on the quality of the picture you get. Like if you get a really blurry picture, um, it's not gonna ID it. The next thing I'm gonna walk you through is the start bird ID. So it's that big green box in the middle. I'm gonna go ahead and click that. And it's gonna ask me a series of five questions to kind of narrow down what bird um, um, it is. So uh, where did you see the bird? We're, I'm in Milwaukee, so I'm gonna select Milwaukee, but you can click on map and you can click specifically of where you are. Um, I'll click on map just to uh, show you. Um, so like if, if I was birding at Riverside Park, I could then, I could click next. Why don't we go ahead and do that? We'll say next at Riverside Park in Milwaukee. You'll then pick the date of when you saw that bird. We'll pretend we saw the bird today. We'll click next. And then it'll ask me what size the bird was. And it'll give me four general common birds to compare the size to. The largest being a goose or larger, the second being a crow, the third being a robin, and the fourth being a sparrow. The sparrows smaller than the robin, about half the size. They kind of all double in size generally, from the sparrow to the robin, to the crow, to the goose. Uh, we'll pretend I saw a, a cardinal, um, and uh, so that's about the size of a robin, right? Okay, so that's the size. We're gonna click next. We'll pretend I saw a male cardinal, um, which is pretty red. Um, females are, have a little bit more brown in them, but we're going to say we saw a male cardinal, which would mean it was red. And we're going to click next. And then it, uh, cardinals like to eat at feeders. And so we'll say I saw eating at a feeder and I'll click next then. And that's the five out of five. And we'll click next at the very bottom. And boom, it has guessed uh, my bird. Um, if it wasn't the cardinal, uh, it gave me rose-breasted grosbeak, which has red in it, um, and they could be eating at feeders as well. So it was a good guess, but it guessed my northern cardinal. Now let's, now let's do a little bit of a harder bird. Um, let's say I saw a nuthatch, uh, white-breasted nuthatch, which is about the size of a sparrow. I'm going to click uh, next, and uh, Instead of seeing uh, red, I saw white and blue for a white-breasted nuthatch. I'm going to click next. Uh, let's say I saw it climbing, climbing around on a tree or a branch. And then I'll click next, and it's going to guess my bird. Ah, blue throated, black-throated blue warbler. That is a blue and white bird that hangs out in the, in, in the trees and branches. That's not the bird I saw, though. Um, so you can scroll down. Blue gray gnat catcher, that's a plausible one. Blue headed vireo, another plausible bluebird. Uh, boom, there's my white breasted nuthatch. Um, so you could say that it guessed incorrectly, but I gave it the best information to my knowledge and it did an okay job at guessing that. However, if I go back and I saw it eating at a feeder, which it often eats at a feeder if you have uh, the appropriate food out there, and I click next, just by changing this one simple observation, is now my top pick, it's now its top pick for that bird. So um, depending, it depends a lot about what information you put in, but if you can put in the most accurate information, um, it does a pretty darn good job of guessing the bird. Uh, I'm gonna go back home. Um, there's an explore birds function at the bottom. Um, uh, depending what bird pack you have, um, if you click on the top right at those three little line bars, um, you can see I have the Midwest Bird Pack installed. Um, and then you can go, go, go ahead and look through these. Um, and if you click on them, we'll give you a little bit of information. Um, I use this for ID when I'm out in the field because it's a free app. And so uh, depending if I think I saw um, some type of swallow, 
um, I'll, I'm in the swallow section and then I'm like, hmm, I saw a swallow that was swooping around. It had a blue back and a white belly. Let me click on tree swallow. And now I can swipe through the pictures um, and see if that looks like the one I saw. You can play the sounds down at the bottom middle. You can click on the sounds and play their calls as well. Um, and uh, you can see their range map in the bottom right. Uh, as if you had your own uh, paper uh, Sibley guide with you. Um, this is just an incredible app that I really, really enjoy and it's free and I use it uh, for bird ID, for calls uh, and stuff like that. So I highly encourage you to download that and use that tomorrow morning. All right, the next thing I'm gonna talk about <clears throat> is the Song Sleuth app. It, um, you'll see it's starting to record me right now <clears throat> as I talk, um, but basically if you go to the top left, top uh, those three gray bars, um, and you can click on species list, um, we'll show you a bunch of birds. These are the most common ones right now in Wisconsin. And uh, for one thing in this app, you can play their song. You can click play. There you go, there's a red-bellied woodpecker. Um, and uh, let's see, if you go to recording list, ah, uh, yes, I've done, I've done some in the past. Okay, if you go to, let's say, black cap chickadee and you click on that green, um, what's, I don't know how to describe it, green, graph type bar to the right. You can actually see what the call looks like. If you, you can zoom in with two fingers, if you, kind of, you can't see me doing it, but I'm like um, kind of zooming in with two fingers. You can see what that looks like actually as it tra the sound of the chickadee as it travels through uh, air. If you click the play, bo play button at the bottom, you can actually hear it. There you go. Um, and so that's pretty cool to like understand how the call is working. Like if you look at different bird calls, it's just really cool to see, like, let's go to the wood thrush. Um, someone said they, they saw that, like, that looks totally different than the black cap chickadee. Um, and so obviously it sounds different, but now you can actually see the difference in how it sounds. So we're gonna click play here. And there's your beautiful wood thrush call and you can see it for yourself. All right, but say you hear birds outside singing, um, and what you can do is if you go tap record an ID in the top left, I'm gonna go ahead and click that. And uh, it's not recording until you click the bottom, uh, the button in the bottom, um, but I'm gonna try to pretend to be a chickadee or a morning dove or something, and I'm gonna click record. And I'm going to stop and see it's now automatically identified that sound as possibly being a bird and it's put a box around it. However, if it did a bad job or if I want to enlarge my box, I can just tap the corner and kind of move it around like that. But I'm going to put it right around uh, that call I made. And then the top left, you're going to click run ID. All right, it thinks I was an American toad, a human, or an, an American uh, crow. So obviously I, I was making my own noise up, but someone said before that it did a, it correctly identified a wood thrush uh, singing earlier a couple days ago. Um, so if you have the real bird singing and you record it and you correctly uh, select the box um, around the bird call, uh, it, it uh, will potentially uh, ID the bird depending on how good of a uh, sound quality you have. So, um, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing here. So those were uh, two apps, the uh, Merlin Bird ID and the Song Sleuth that will help you identify birds um, both by sight and by sound, um, which is very, very helpful. All right, uh, moving on, we are now gonna learn how to submit a checklist. Um, let me share my screen with you. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go back actually to the iPhone. We're gonna first submit a checklist on the um, 
on the uh, iPad. So let me share screen. All right. So if you go to eBird, if you downloaded eBird, I've deleted it and pretended like I'm brand new on eBird here for you. And you're going to see a couple of images. Um, you can just click continue. It's kind of cool to read. But I've already talked about some of this, about kind of what eBird does and stuff like that. Uh, it's not a bird ID app. That's the Merlin bird app that I just talked about. So go ahead and click continue and then get started. Um, <clears throat> here, if you don't have an account already, um, go ahead and create an account at the bottom uh, where it says create account. Uh, it's pretty simple like creating any other account. However, I'm already logged in <clears throat> up top with um, uh, our, our Urban Ecology Center account. So I'm going to go ahead and click sign in, um, assuming that you already have signed in yourself if you're following along. You'll see a couple preferences that you can choose from here. Uh, Tim Vargo recommends using for the species name to learn both common and scientific. Um, you just, uh, it's just good to know scientific names uh, as you continue on in your birding, uh, your birding career, I guess. So I have both selected, but you can go to common if you want. So I'm gonna keep it for both. Um, when there isn't enough room, because I'm on an uh, iPad or an iPhone or an Android, you can choose when they run out of room. You can choose common or scientific. You can choose. Oops. You can choose your language there uh, under common name language. Um, don't worry about show subspecies for data entry. That's a little more advanced. And then show distance in miles and kilometers. You get to. It's up to you what you would like. And then go ahead and click continue. And now this will ask you for get a bird pack, kind of similar to the Merlin bird ID. Um, so let's see, you could do view suggested packs, um, allow while using app, uh, then they'll kind of like pick the best um, bird pack to give you if you get allow it to use your location. And then it says Wisconsin, I'm gonna say get pack. Um, this downloads pretty quickly if you just get the pack for one state, but if you download it for the entire country, it might take a while. So I recommend you're on Wi-Fi when you're downloading that app. Um, or when you're downloading the pack, I should say. All right, so we'll finish up. Now that I have the pack installed on eBird, I'm ready to submit my first checklist. So you'll be doing this tomorrow. Um, say you're doing the home challenge. Um, I can't send the checklist in the future, so I'm gonna pretend like tomorrow morning was this morning. And so I'm gonna click start time. And I'm gonna say I start at 8 a.m. I'm scrolling on the iPad right now. I know you can't see me doing that, but that's what I'm doing on the iPad. And uh, I click done, 8 a.m. And you will then click start checklist at the bottom. All right, the great thing about again, what I talked about earlier in, in, in the lecture is that eBird helps sort out well over 10,000 species of birds that you're likely not going to see, that you won't be seeing at all, in fact. Right, if you had 10,000 birds to look through to determine which ones you saw, you would go crazy. So eBird does that automatically for you and has narrowed that list down to about 100 birds. This is the list of birds that we're seeing here that I'm scrolling through. That is way shorter than 10,000. Like that's just to know that you might see a wood duck or a gadwall or a widgeon or a mallard uh, is just really helpful that it's hard to understand how helpful it is. So just letting you know. All right, so now it's time to enter the birds you're seeing in your, during the home challenge. Um, let's say I saw uh, two mallards in my backyard. You see the mallards right here in the middle. Um, you can click that plus button to the left of it. One, two. Every time you click it, it adds one at a time. Uh, as you continue scrolling through, um, let's see, um, that's another good bird that people might see. Um, hmm. A great blue heron. People recognize great blue herons, and so if you see that, you can click the plus button as well. Um, and uh, that's how you can, uh, that's how you add numbers of birds that you see. Uh, I really recommend that you, uh, 
to the best of your ability, determine how many birds you've seen, um, rather than just saying, if you saw three great blue herons and you're like, oh, I just, uh, I'll just put in one just to say I, I saw great blue herons, I really recommend you, you try to put in an accurate number of birds uh, that you, you have seen. All right, another way that you can enter in data is, let's say I saw four American robins um, during the challenge. You can go to the top bar where it says species name slash code and click on that. And again, let's say I saw four robins. So I'm gonna click, I'm gonna type in four space and I'm gonna type in robin here. And there it automatically found some American robin for me. And when I click it, it automatically populates those four American robins for me. So I don't have to scroll down to find American robin and tap it four times um, to get four in. So uh, let's say I saw two white-breasted nuthatches. I'll do another example. Two, I, I'm just gonna type in nuthatch, and it's pretty smart, and it gives me all the nuthatches I could be seeing. Um, if you see a red dot or an R next to the bird, that means it is pretty rare or has not been reported in the last 10 years in your area. So I would not expect to see a brown-headed nuthatch uh, tomorrow if you're in uh, Milwaukee. So I saw two white-breasted nuthatches, nut hatches, which is plausible. And there you go, it automatically populates. But now let's say uh, I accidentally click on winter wren and said I saw two winter wrens and I'm like, uh, nope, I didn't see two winter wrens. You'll see that there's no subtract button. So what you can do is if you click on winter wren, instead of putting in zero winter wrens, what you can just do is click the delete button or that little like backspace button and it goes to, it just shows the, the number sign, the pound sign. And there you go, it's gone. So if you make a mistake, no worries. Uh, I'm gonna show you a function in the bottom, or I'm gonna show you the comment function in the bottom left, the checklist comments. Uh, usually uh, this is good to put in weather information, unusual things like I saw a fox or I started at the north end of the park and went south or anything specific that will help the, the data analysis for the scientists on the other end. In this case, I'm going to ask that you include your team name and, oh crap, what was the other thing? I forgot it in the previous lecture. Uh, team name and, oh yeah, and what challenge you're doing. So my team name is City Flickers. So I'm gonna type that in and I'm gonna do uh, comma, uh, home challenge. So I, if you can add that comment, that will help us a lot tomorrow. We're going to be getting like a hundred checklists from people. So this will really help us like narrow down the data quickly. Um, all right. So you can click done, go ahead and add other comments here if you would like, but uh, for tomorrow, if you could include that, that would be great. Click done. Also for your, your sorting, um, uh, you can sort the list that you see right now. Like there's still a lot of birds and that's overwhelming. Um, so if you click the, in the bottom left, those three green uh, line bars, um, it'll give you a setting on how you can sort it. Right now I have it sorted by text, uh, uh, taxonomic sort. Uh, um, but you can go to smart sort and basically that uh, tells you what ones you're most likely to be see, seeing. And it takes away all those other birds that are uncommon, but plausible to see. So right now the birds that you're seeing here are like, you definitely have a good chance at seeing these birds. Um, maybe not, yeah. All right. Now that you've finished your checklist, um, uh, you may have seen 50 birds, you may have seen two, and you may have even seen zero. If you see zero birds, that is, a, that is real good data that helps people know that there are no birds in your area. And that's just as important as, see, as if you had a hundred birds in that area. So really important to know that you should not feel bad if you only have one species of birds. Um, that, is, that is just as helpful again as having a hundred. A way to quickly check to see how many um, birds you've seen is if you click that little four button, again, that could be four, zero, or a hundred, depending on how many birds you've seen. And um, you could be like, 
hmm, I forgot, I saw a cardinal. I'm gonna quickly add that. So you're gonna go up to the search code and you do one card no, and go ahead and add that. So you, if you forget anything, you can look here quickly to add that. Hey, All right, now it's time. We have a quick question. Sure. Um, about the eBird app on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, when I use the search bar at the top of a checklist to search for a species, the keypad defaults to numbers and symbols and not letters. Does this happen to you too or how to change that default? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I, I'm right where you are, where I, I click the, where I'm in the species name slash code. Um, and for me, it's defaulted to numbers and symbols. That's because it wants you to put in a number of the bird species you've seen. So um, rather than seeing I saw a nuthatch or I saw a cardinal, it's asking how many. So it's gonna ask you for a number first. So let's say I saw five tree swallows. I'm gonna put in, I'm gonna click the number here at top five. If you then click space, it then knows that you are about to type in the species itself, the name of the species. Um, and it'll then go to the, the text. However, you can interchange it in the bottom left if you click that the number one, two, three, or ABC, and you can go back and forth between the numbers and the text. So I saw five tree swallows, there we go. So yes, again, it will show you the numbers first because it wants to know how many you saw of them, and then it will ask you to type in uh, the, the specific species that you saw. Great question. All right, now your time to review. You're gonna to go to the bottom right and you're gonna click review. And at the top, you're gonna to see choose location. Uh, it's important to choose your location. Uh, you'll see three options, recent, nearby, and map at the top. Uh, for us, nearby, we, we have a lot of uh, locations that we've been birding at for the Urban Ecology Center. But what you can do is go ahead and go to map and uh, pick a location. So if your backyard is over here on the east side of Milwaukee, um, say my house is this one, one of these in the middle. Uh, what you can do is you could physically click, you have to kind of hold for a, a split second. Um, that's maybe Ethan's backyard, but you might feel uncomfortable giving that information. It's pretty secure, but if you do feel uncomfortable, you can then say your location is say an intersection of a street nearby. So instead of giving exact location of my backyard, I'm going to put it over here. You see in the bottom where I, I've placed it. Um, so I'm going to say use this location. So it's fine if you're, you're maybe um, 50 yards away from your actual location. Um, uh, so no worries about that. All right, it's gonna ask you for a different ways of how you birded, whether you was traveling, stationary, or incidental. You're gonna be either entering traveling if you were uh, in the neighborhood challenge or stationary if you're doing the home challenge. Uh, stationary is if you're birding through a window, uh, you're hawk watching, or you're in one specific area for the entire challenge. Traveling is if you want more than 30 meters, so like if you're in a park, going from one end of the park to the other, or something like that. We'll say I'm in the home challenge and I, and I did a stationary count, so I'm gonna select that. Uh, you're gonna put in your time. Uh, so for two hours, that would be 120 minutes. And I can't put anything in for miles because it was a stationary count. Now, tomorrow we're gonna to be asking you to share this checklist with the Urban Ecology Center so we can get that data from you. You'll see that there's no that the only way to do that is is for you to share, and there's no share function right now. What you're gonna do is even if you're observing by yourself, you're gonna enter in two observers and click done. I'll click done the green done, and now you'll see the share share checklist option has come up, and that's super super important for tomorrow. And you're gonna be click selecting share checklist with. And you're gonna share it with Urban Eco CTR, and you're gonna click done. And then now it says it will be shared with one eBirder. One eBirder is that's kind of weird, but yeah. If you leave that observers as one, it will not be. Uh, uh, you won't have that share option. So really important that you put two observers, even if you're by yourself. 
if you were doing a stationary count, um, uh, the, it'll just then ask you for the number of miles you went. Uh, I could say I went two miles. I'll click done there. Um, again, you want two observers at least, so you can the share function will come up. And then right below, we'll be shared with one eBirders. It says, is this a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify? And you're going to select yes. Basically, this means you identified to the best of your ability of the birds in that area when you were birding. So um, you recorded all the, the house sparrows and any other bird that you saw um, and that you were specifically birding. So just click select yes if you were really intent on birding and you tried to bird to the best of your ability. And then you will click submit. I'm not gonna click submit because I don't wanna submit this uh, erroneous data that I did not collect. Um, but once you submit, it will then share with us and you're good to go. All right, so that's how you do it on uh, eBird Mobile. I'm gonna quickly show you how to do it online. Um, I'm gonna do stop share here. And I'm gonna share my screen with you. And this is where it'd be helpful if you have eBird open right now with you, you can follow along. Um, otherwise, um, just uh, go ahead and listen and ask questions. Um, so once you go to eBird Home, you're going to go to Submit in the top left. And you're going to see Choose from Your Location. Uh, it's going to ask you for location just like on the eBird Mobile. Um, uh, you're not going to have any locations likely in here because if you're new to eBird, you haven't used uh, locations before. And so you're going to use Find It on the Map. So I'm going to type in Milwaukee. You can type in whatever city you are from, and it'll kind of zoom into your city. And you can click these plus buttons to zoom in a little bit more. Or you can do control zoom to zoom in. And I'm going to pick, uh, pretend that my house uh, is right here. OK? Let's pretend, if this is your house, whatever it is. So again, I could click right there if that's my actual backyard. But if you feel uncomfortable with that, I would recommend that you pick an intersection nearby. So instead of clicking right there, I'm gonna click this intersection here, and I'm gonna name it Ethan's uh, Backyard. You can see I've already done this. I'm gonna name it three, Ethan's Backyard three. So go ahead and find your backyard wherever you are and uh, click uh, on a nearby spot and name it whatever you would like. You can, you can name it something else in backyard or something like that, so whatever you would like. We have a quick right. question. Sure. Yes. Um, will eBird still work if I have my phone in airplane mode to save battery while I'm out walking around? Yes, it will. <clears throat> um, yeah, that, that brings up a more in-depth point that I don't really have time to go over um, for tracking your route. Um, but yes, if we'll still, um, you can start tracking yourself. Um, uh, I should, I'll show you quickly. What I mean, all right, let's see if we can do this quickly. Uh, all right, we're gonna go back. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna submit it, so I'll delete it later. Um, you'll see that when you open up eBird, there'll be an option right here where it says record track. And you can see it's selected on right now. So if I have that on, it's only works for eBird Mobile if you have your phone on you. I can then, right at 8 a.m., <clears throat> I can click Start Checklist with that record track. And it's now, you can see the time is going at the top. And if I start walking, the mileage will move up too. Um, I believe you can go into airplane mode at this point, and it'll still track uh, where you're walking, and it'll save a little bit of battery. But from what I've heard, um, um, as long as you just have your phone off, I don't think you have to go into airplane mode, um, and I don't think your, your battery will, will die. Um, but just having your phone screen off is probably the most important thing to save your battery life. Okay, I'm gonna click stop here. Um, so, okay. Hopefully that answered your question, but I'm just gonna get, I'm gonna finish up with uh, entering it on um, eBird.org.
Can you tell me again what the abbreviation for sharing with the Urban Ecology Center is? Sure, it's Urban, uh, Urban with capital U, and then Eco with a capital E, and then CTR uh, with capital C. Urban Eco CTR. That's all one word or dots in between? All one word, no spaces. Okay, thanks. Good question. All right, we're going to continue after we select our location. And it's going to ask us for the date. So we're going to put in, we're, again, we're going to pretend like today is tomorrow. And we're going to say it was a stationary. We were at home. We started at 8 a.m. I went for two hours, and zero minutes. And here you can actually put in party size of one if you were by yourself. If you're with a family, you can put in five, you can put in whatever, whatever is, is correct. And you'll click continue. All right, now you're gonna see that exact same species list that you saw on eBird Mobile. So you could say, I saw two mallards here. Um, uh, let's just scroll down randomly. Uh, I saw five tree swallows. And so you're just gonna type numbers in from your computer onto eBird. Uh, I saw one house wren. I saw 10 American robins. Um, again, try not to count the same bird. If you see a robin flying back and forth, the same one, don't count it 10 times, just one robin. These are 10 individual robins that I saw. Um, you can sort things differently um, here. Or this is where you can have the scientific or common name, and the preferences uh, right over here. Um, and then you can sort things either by alphabetical or taxonomic. Um, I'm gonna sort things alphabetically or I can sort it taxonomically. Um, so basically again, it's like eBird Mobile, uh, all the species of birds that you're likely to see, you might see a Baltimore Oriole tomorrow, um, common grackle, and then at the very end, it's gonna ask you, are you submitting a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify? And you're gonna click yes. And then you're gonna click submit. All right, but you still have to share, share this checklist with the Urban Ecology Center. And so you're gonna go, once you click submit, you're gonna see the share button kind of here in the top left. You're gonna click on that. And you're gonna type in urban. You'll see all these people I've shared it with over here. Um, but uh, you're going to type in urban eco CTR and then share checklist. Right now I'm on the actual or the one that the account that you'll be sharing with so I'm not going to share it but then you'll be clicking share. So at this point you should know how to submit a checklist on bo both eBird.org and on eBird mobile. Um, there are a couple other things that you there's so much more you can do on eBird.org about like looking at um, species, trends and patterns, adding photos and stuff like that, um, but we don't have time for that um, and you just need to know how to submit a checklist.